this working or not? Yeah, it's fine. Recording. Hmm? Just for the oh, just for the recording. I want to welcome you to the first of a number of lectures this summer on the summer series. There is a listing out, and I think you can perhaps keep a record and, or uh, be aware of what is being <coughs> spoken of and on on a particular day. Tomorrow is uh, in the same room at 3 o'clock. It'll be Jody Rottler, who's in, in, been involved in the women's liberation movement here and also associated with the union, who's <coughs> going to speak on forgotten the exact title, but the role of women and stereotypes, stereotype views that we should remove. And for this almost predominantly male audience, I would suggest that maybe some of you come <laughs> and uh, get <coughs> straightened out. Uh, this time, I'd like to introduce Professor Fuad, who will introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Nils Christian Westermark is Professor of Agriculture, Agricultural Economics at the University of Helsinki. He, uh, his uh, vita is, is quite uh, long and uh, I selected just few things to give uh, our audience who are not familiar with Dr. Westermark's background some idea about his credentials. Uh, among the former positions he held in his country, Finland, uh, various positions with the uh, production of food, and including being Minister of Agriculture, which corresponds in this country to uh, being Secretary of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, from Mark's talk today, is entitled Post-War Technological, Economic, and Institutional Development in USSR Agricultural Development. Dr. Westermark. I think that perhaps everybody knows that um, the farms in Soviet Union are organized either as collective farms called kolhoses or are run directly by the state as sovhoses. In both cases, the land is the property of the state. The sovhos is entirely owned and controlled by the state. Sovhoz workers have paid summer holidays and other social privileges. For example, they are paid the same wage even in poor years. Except on very prosperous coal horses, the coal horse farmers have had none of these advantages. A coal horse farmer can influence decision making and thus has a double function. He is both employer as a member of the coal horse and employed. The recent history of Soviet agriculture dates from 53, when Stalin died. Incentives in agriculture then were miserable. Wages were low or non-existent and state procurement prices low. During 53 to 58, thanks to the opening up of new lands, some good seasons, and Nikita Khrushchev's enthusiasm, Soviet agricultural production increased by about 50%. This led Soviet planners to have too high hopes of what might be achieved later on. Already after the winding up of the new economic policy in the Soviet in the 30s, there has been a fairly consistent tendency to increase the number of and extent of sow horses in relation to coal horses. Whereas at first, sow horses occupied only 25% of the sown area, 
In 1970, they occupied around half. Their share has been increased both by the creation almost exclusively of sow horses in the new land areas and by the conversion of coal horses to sow horses. A comparison of selected 70 data brings out market differences between the two types of farms, even now that they have become more similar. In table one, which has been distributed to you, I do hope that everybody has it, has a, a copy. Uh, we have some statistical data. We have not time to penetrate those data more uh, truly, but uh, we can see that for the time being, there are about 34,000 coal horses and 15,000 uh, sow horses, and the total sown area is in the both group are uh, relatively similar. We also see that uh, the average sown area per farm in hectares in the coal horse sector is lower than in the sow horse sectors. The farms, the sow horses are therefore larger, about two and a half times so large as the coal horses. Coal horse households uh, ha are allowed to have private plots. Sow horse workers have less freedom through even they have access to some privately operated land. But the land in all cases is owned by the state. Coal horse families have been criticized for devoting much more effort to their private plots, which occupy only a small, namely 3.2% of the farm area, but are used intensively. Coal horse and sow horse types of farm differ also according to payment. The land, as already mentioned, always is owned by the state. Although on a small scale, there are uh, the house, household plots are run on capitalist uh, principles. The farmers devote much time to their cultivation, resulting in high yields. The marketing of the produce of personal subsidiary farming, I mean this is the same as household plots, deviates from the principle of a socialist economy and resembles the capitalist pattern. In times of scarcity, the price is determined by supply and demand. The farmers sell their surplus products on these conditions. Families living far from cities are likely to consume most of their products themselves. But if a city is close by, it is more uh, probably that they bring their commodities uh, to the market and sell them for cash. The families are not only allowed to sell their produce. They are free to determine their prices, even if there are set two or three times higher than the level in the state-owned stories. The government accepts this form of private initiative and thus a system of double marketing prices is created. As it is quite usual that commodities are sometimes not available in the state-owned stores, a profit of this kind is generally made and it is entirely legal. It should be pointed out, however, that the significance of the market is relatively small. The state-owned and cooperative stores control the trade. However, the free markets function as a kind of barometer indicating consumers' wishes. Moreover, the household plots are the safety valve of socialist agriculture, which levels the fluctuation in a uh, socialized uh, production. Bendisen say some few words about the coal horses contra the sow horses. Then in 
the Soho sector, in the state farm sector, we can say that uh, every, ent ent uh, every Soho is an independent enterprise and it's given a definite <coughs> assignment for the production of agricultural commodities that are needed by the country's economy. Each state farm has a main branch in which it's specialized, proceeding from the planned assignments of the state for producing marketable output. Additional branches are organized for a more efficient use of the resources. In big state farms with favorable conditions, these branches organized on a large scale are highly mechanized. State farms and other state agriculture enterprises account for the time being for about 38% of the total marketable agriculture output, while the coal horses account for 50%. And consequently, the residual 12% is produced on the household plots. The state authorities determine the prices for agricultural commodities in the different parts of the Soviet Union, except what has already mentioned on the household post where the uh, price, where, where no price regulations exist. The producer's prices are the result of a compromise between two contrary goals. On the one hand, the prices must be sufficiently low to warrant a high productivity in the industry sector. On the other hand, sufficiently high to make possible an increased production and investment on the farms, serving the maintenance of reasonable standards of living for the farm people. Today, price calculations are based on the average production cost per produced unit. I think it's a, a rather uh, interesting phenomenon the price calculation is based on the average production cost per produced unit for every enterprise. This favors farms with a high cost and a poor economic position. Rational units miss certain advantages, but they are compensated for this by the privilege of receiving a higher price for produce exceeding the planned amount. Then, coming back to the period during uh, Khrushchev's era, the general repression of the private sector under Khrushchev's regime is generally known, I suppose so. Under Khrushchev, the sow horses were pressed to restrict private enterprises. Although the assurance had been made that in transforming coal horses into sow horses, the size of the household plots would not be diminished. The campaign against the plots and livestock of sow horse workers, in fact, resulted in such restrictions in the new sow horses. Both the general restriction of the private sector and the specific results of the conversions into sow horses affected a shift or private agriculture production to workers, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to the southern climatically favored parts of the country with their predominantly intensive soil utilization. The transfer into sow horses from coal horses had a double significance and effect. Not only did it shift weight from the coal horses to the sow horses, but also from the private to the socialized sector in general. But since Khrushchev's removal in 64, 64 the transformation of coal horses into sow horses has to a great extent lost this side effect. The reason is that the norms governing the use of the soil and the keeping of livestock for private purposes introduced in 64 for sow horse workers no longer differ in essence 
from the private operations <coughs> existing in the Kolho sector. Here one can see an important new development, the effects of which will be of great interest in the coming years. Since the restrictions of the private sector were abolished in some horses after the removal of Khrushchev, a new increase in private production has occurred. According to the German expert, Dr. Wedeking, whom I have cited here in many uh, respects, the age structure of the Soviet farm population is uh, generally a uh, rather unfavorable one, differs in its effect in the private and in the social sector. The private sector gains more workers as more retired people become available. The Soviet scientist Tikhonov looks on the existence of a private, private production sector in somewhat different way to what I have here mentioned. According to him, the socialist labor is practically the only form of professional labor. Even labor in personal subsidiary farming is in fact, according to Tikhonov, a particle of labor utilized in socialist society in a planned way. The share of the gross product of personal subsidiary farming is systematically declining in view of the growth of the socialist uh, sector. But for some types of produce, personal subsidiary farming still accounts for a considerable share. A potatoes, 62%, eggs, 50%, vegetables 40, meat and milk 38% in 71. At the same time, in the production of wool, the socialist sector prevails, and in the production of grain, sunflower seed, cotton and sugar beet, it completely predominates. The share of personal subsidiary farming in the marketable output of agriculture amounts to 8% in the output of crop husbandry and to 16% in the output of animal husbandry. Personal subsidiary farming differs from small peasant farming and even private enterprises according to Tikhanov in the following respects. First, it is organically connected with the common enterprise of the state and collective farms and is conducted on the farm yard plots, which are property of the state. Second, a considerable part of the raw materials consumed in the personal subsidiary farming is produced directly in the social sector or with the help of socialized means of production. Third, the main part of the labor in subsidiary farming is contributed by persons who, owing to the age, are not included in the total labor force of agriculture, that means juveniles and retired people, and also non-working members of families engage in socialized production. Through not socialized, labor in personal subsidiary farming is a particle of the socialist social labor. Its efficiency is determined by the efficiency of labor in the social sector of agricultural production as regards the statement of uh, Dr. Tikhonov. Toward the end of his administration, Khrushchev made the following statement. The sow horses are state enterprises. They are easier to control and to administrate. They give better assurance that the investment of capital will be, and the investment will be more rationally utilized. That a similar attitude is prevalent also today is apparent in that in all references to specialization and localization, which are emphasized over and over again, the sow horses are given obvious preference. 
As long as the balance of labor in Soviet agriculture is not even, as long as there are acute deficiency symptoms in some parts of the country and a surplus of labor in other parts, the development of production in the three sectors, sow horses, coal horses, and household plots, depends decisively on the availability of labor. It is not by chance that a transfer into sow horses on a large scale took place mainly in parts of the country that had a more or less critical balance of labor. For the time being, the transfer from coal horses to sow horses take place more slowly, obviously, in my opinion, owing to the fact that such a change claims large amounts of capital and adjustment of organization and management. In the Soviet Union, the question as to the desirable size of enterprises has been settled on the basis of political doctrine without having been subjected enough to theoretical research. Only subsequently has the problem of the optimal size of a farm unit attract attention and certain investigations seem to indicate that the giant enterprises do not represent the optimal size. They have exceeded it. The question may be posed as to whether the huge of horses and coal horses with many departments running their own accounts and with separate managerial centers should still be considered as operational units. This role seems to have been taken over by the various departments. In accordance uh, with Marx's doctrine, it was considered appropriate to furnish socialized agriculture enterprises with modern technological equipment. First, the sow horses were supplied as far as possibly with tractors and machinery. As regards the coal horses, a proper plan of organization was lacking in the 20s. However, at the end of this decade, such a plan was developed as a special socialist solution to the problem of mechanization. However, for 30 years, from 28 to 58, a certain complement to the coal horses existed in the form of machine tractor station MTS. And that was perhaps one of the most conspicuous characteristics of the socialist agriculture system. The MTS organization, I mean the machine tractor station organization, uh, functioned as the industrial material technical basis of the coal horse system. This form of organization which played an important role and part in the collectivization of Soviet agriculture is today abandoned. However, a development that does not seem surprising. Weaved against the background of the communist doctrine the coal horse system as such is also a tra transitional form. In a way, the MTS experiment can also be viewed as a trial of excessive specialization. It implied a separation of machine technology from the production units proper. Technology was organized as large service enterprises. It is obvious, however, that the advantages of large-scale farming and specialization could not compensate for the harmful consequences of isolating organic parts from the production units. The managerial problems of the MTS organization was not solved to satisfaction either. During the period of the MTS, uh, existence, the coal horses were not allowed to possess any machinery equipment, 
they had to use the service of the machine tractor stations. When the colhoses were enlarged, this arrangement ceased to be rational. And with the course of the time, the political control over the colhoses exercised by the MTS, political sections had become unnecessary. The Communist Party had established sub-organizations within the colhoses, which made external control organs superfluous. Moreover, the MTS system had proved very expensive because tens of thousands of so-called brigadeurs had been employed by the MTS and the coal horses in parallel for almost exactly the same tasks. A, the basic form of labor organization in the Soviet agriculture is the brigade work. Labor brigades are formed usually uh, in consisting of 30 to 40 workers under the leadership of a brigadeur. The brigades are often divided into subgroups of five to ten workers under a group leader. It is, however, not possible here to discuss in detail the development of the brigade system. It may briefly be stated that after the abandonment of the MTS system, the labor organization of the coal horses has approached that of the sow horses, and the difference between them will probably soon disappear altogether. The current tendency is to institute brigades with a complete machine equipment. There are today field brigades, livestock brigades, and in addition, so-called universal brigades. Furthermore, there are mechanized labor groups which are designated for certain special tasks such as the cultivation of sugar beets, corn, and potatoes. The basic form of remuneration at coal horses and sow horses is payment according to performance, but time wages also occur. When automation has been realized, wages per hour are considered to be a potentially even more progressive form of remuneration than payment according to performance. So far, however, the latter system has been predominant in the Soviet Union. A fundamental distinctive feature of labor in large socialist agriculture enterprises, state and coal horse farms is the ever deeper division of labor. In the agriculture prior to the Great Revolution 1917, the peasant, as a rule, performed all the jobs in crop and animal husbandry. A collective farmer or state farm worker specialized in performing operation in one branch. This reduces the number of functions he performs and creates favorable conditions for acquiring higher skill. The number of universal workers is reduced and the number of workers with a narrow specialization increases. The expansion of the technical facilities and transition of industri to industrial methods make new demands on the educational level of personnel in the mass vocations. A need arises in workers who have not only special training but also a sufficiently high level of general education. In view of this, the general educational level of workers in crop and animal husbandry is swiftly rising. At a seminar held some years ago in Warsaw, Poland, arranged by the Polish Academy of Science and the International um, Association of Agriculture Economists. One research worker from Soviet Union, Madame Saslavskaya, from the Siberian branch of the USSR Academy of Science, uh, presented an interesting paper dealing with the labor productivity and shortage of labor in Siberia. 
From her paper, I have quoted the following rather critical comments. Most eastern areas of the Soviet are notable for rigorous climate, but the southern part of Siberia is agriculturally productive, suitable for livestock and grain growing. The efficiency of agriculture in western Siberia is 20% above the average for the Soviet Union. The cost of the most important products is the same as the average for the country. The main factor retarding the rate of agricultural development in Siberia is the shortage of labor. Evaluations conclude that if a fuller and more effective utilization of production resources is the aim, the number of agricultural workers must be increased in Siberia. But this is very difficult to achieve. There is a high migration rate of Siberian rural people to the cities. As a result, the number of rural workers in Western Siberia is falling even quicker than the average for the country. The rapid outflow of young people from the Siberian countryside has serious consequences in rural social life and it impedes agricultural progress by diminishing the number of skilled workers and equipment needed to run the ever expanding fleet of tractors and other machinery. The findings of Madame Sashlavskaya were that a significant rise of production was achieved only in those groups of farms which succeeded in increasing their numbers of workers. Planning calculations support the view that economic efficiency would be served by increasing the number of workers in Siberian agriculture. But this result has not been attained in practice. The number of rural workers has decreased faster than the average for the Soviet. This calls for research into the reasons and motives for the mobility of the rural workers and for working out practical measures for controlling it from the national level down to the level of a single enterprise. The farms which suffer most from labor shortages continue to lose labor while those better supplied gain new workers because they can offer better working and living conditions. In Siberian regions, a strong tendency to move from collective farms to state farms was recently noticed. This fact, together with the direct evidence obtained in a special survey of the population of collective and state farms, points to the need to achieve a more rational control over the movement of labor in collective and state farms. The living conditions of the people in collective farms are still far worse than those in state farms. The rates of pay are lower and the provision of housing, education and medical facilities, transport services and consumer goods is worse. At the same time, collective farms as a form of economy have a good prospect, uh, I'm sorry, as a form of economy have as good prospects and are as viable as state farms, Madame Tsarslavskaya states. With equal rates of pay, provision of equipment and transport facilities, the mobility of labor in collective farms appears more favorable than on state farms. Therefore, the task is to level up the economic and living conditions of a population of collective and state farms. An important factor of migration to the city is dissatisfaction with the system of leadership in agriculture. The rural population suffers from much from middle-level supervisors, such as brigadeurs and others who have often had very little formal training. In contrast to the young generation first coming to work in industry, the low educational level of the supervisors 
and their repugnance towards any innovation often cause psychological strains and conflicts in young people who eventually leave the land. Well, what I just have mentioned was an excerpt of a paper elucidating in a critically prospective way prevailing problems in the West Siberian agriculture due to technological development in the Siberian society. While the collective farms grew larger and larger, the units reached a stage when existing form of management was inadequate. This has stimulated the development of cooperation among collective farms. At the beginning of 65, there were 4,000 so-called inter-collective organizations. And associations of this type represent forms of what we call for horizontal integration. On the other hand, agricultural enterprises unite with state plants processing farm uh, produce. Processing enterprises are organized within specialized farms and a factory farm arises on this basis or agricultural enterprises associate with trading establishments <coughs> with a view to improve the sales of produce. These form or these forms of association represents vertical integration. And both these type of integration are now uh, typical uh, for the uh, farming in the Soviet Union. I will end in citing some sentences from uh, the 24th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which uh, Congress was held in Moscow uh, one and a half year ago. At this occasion, inter alia, two very interesting reports were delivered. One of them by the Secretary General, uh, Leonid Brezhnev, and the second one by the Premier, Alexei Kosygin. Is it it is indeed worthwhile to give here a very, at least, at least a very brief summary of the statements so far as agriculture is concerned. Brezhnev stressed that for a number of reasons, agriculture has been, and for the time being remains, the most difficult and complex sector of USSR economy. That is why it is a source of satisfaction that the efforts now have been crowned with major achievements, he continued. But he also uh, put his finger on many weak spots in the agriculture in Soviet. He pointed also that as before, increasing grain production is one of the main tasks in the Soviet agriculture. The grain needs have been growing from year to year, and this applies not only to food grain, but also to feed grain, the production of which should, should be expanded in view of the necessity of rapidly developing animal husbandry. Also, uh, Brezhnev mentioned that at present, personal subsidiary husbandry still plays an appreciable role in the production of meat and milk. However, here and there, this does not get the attention it deserves. And then some sentences from the speech of Mr. Kosygin. He also emphasized that increasing grain production remains the key problem in Soviet agriculture. During the forthcoming five-year period, grain yields must be increased, he said, by at least two, uh, four centers per hectare. Though not an easy task, this is quite feasible. Four centers per hectare corresponds roughly to 180 pounds per acre. 
The increasing need of animal produce also calls for a growth in the number of livestock and poultry, an increase in their productivity and an expansion of the output of meat, milk, wool, and other uh, products. To accelerate the growth of the output of livestock farming and enhance it, uh, its efficacy, provision has been made for the building of mechanized stock units at collective and state farms and the setting up near the towns of large state and collective farm are in and inter-collective farm complexes, putting out livestock product by industrial methods and also of poultry factories. One of the immediate tasks in the development of stock farming is to enlarge the fodder resources. An increase of the number of livestock and poultry personally owned, that means the the household plots by the rural population must be encouraged and help rendered in supplying their livestock with fodder and pasture. This statement seems to me is a very interesting one because it implies that the so-called household plots are fully accepted and recognized as a kind of food supply. Also, Mr. Brezhnev, as I just mentioned, pointed out the same matter of facts, although more vaguely. The big qualitative changes taking place in the material and technical basis of agriculture are making new demands on its management system in Soviet. The large-scale, highly mechanized economy of the collective and state farms is drawing ever closer to modern industrial production. Hence the need to apply in agriculture modern forms and methods of management, make wide use of means of mechanization and automation of management processes and train skilled person. Here I have also the second table. I suppose that somebody has already had a look on the uh, table. The table shows uh, the statistical figures for the agricultural production during the uh, last decade, so to say. And here we have an indication of that the production has been risen. Everybody knows, however, that uh, during last year uh, the crop was uh, decreased and everybody knows, I'm sure, also the shipping business from USA to the Soviet for the time being. I don't wish here to put my finger in this business. Uh, nobody knows how permanent it will be. I have here I give, try to give an, an uh, information about the problems now existing in the Soviet Union agriculture. And we can, if we like to sum up what I have said here, we can say that for the time being, Soviet agriculture has intricate economic relations between collective and state farms on the one hand and enterprises and organizations which purchase and process agriculture produce on the other between agriculture enterprises themselves, and so on. Yeah, I'm sure you'd like to hear yeah. questions. Yeah, I don't know how much I like it, but anyway, <laughs> I shall try to answer, yeah. Quite a, uh, uh, should be an oversupply of, of labor on the land. I mean, it's a very high relationship with labor to 
that there is a short syllable in Siberia. My, that, that, my statement about the shortest of labor before to well, this. Is there, is there a <coughs> oversupply of labor, an, un, uh, an under, underemployed uh, labor supply on some of the other? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 well, uh, I, my opinion is that, that is, if, if we take the country as, as a whole, there is an uh, oversupply of labor. But in certain regions, there are a shortest of labor. And uh, then, <coughs> to a one more point. Uh, these numbers of uh, persons engaged in agriculture, which are in indicated here, they, uh, they are not only agricultural uh, workers, and particularly on the coal horses, there are, in those numbers, are included also uh, persons engaged in the services in the school, in the medical uh, care, and, and this kind of, 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 of people. And uh, of course, I should say that is still a, a, a surplus of labor, but maybe the surplus is, is not so great as perhaps uh, these figures uh, can give um, an opinion of. Well, yeah, you. Clarify your interpretation of the production figures here a bit further. Uh, mm -hmm. It clearly shows that from 66 to 70, there's a considerable increase. Yeah, yeah. From over 1961 to 65. Do you see this mainly as a result of better efficiency, particularly on the SOPOSI? Uh, or are there other factors contributing to this? Increased land under production? Uh, to what extent did uh, weather conditions? What are the factors mm -hmm. that make a difference here? What are the reasons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you see, I am not an expert in the Soviet, uh, Soviet agriculture, although I have been there many times. Uh, but um, firstly, I should say that the weather conditions have played a, a considerable role. And uh, secondly, from the uh, statistic, it's evident that the uh, production costs on the sow horses are greater, are higher than the production costs on the whole horses. But this doesn't reflect uh, 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 an objective comparison because the coal horses are located in the more favorable areas of the Soviet Union, and the sow horses are located in, in the more in the in the new land area and, and more more in, in the east. Then uh, I really cannot say which system is, is more efficient. Uh, uh, the the politic anyway, the policy anyway favor the, the, the SOHO system. Are there statistics showing what the increase was on the SOHO system in contrast to the SOHO system? No, I, I have no, I, I have not found it. Yeah, of course we can, no, no. I, I have not found this, uh, such uh, figures. But there, perhaps there, are, that we, we can get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. In the private plots, do they or they use simpler, simpler um, uh, tools and then, uh, then there is, as a matter of fact, there uh, exists uh, what we can call a, 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 co a, a concealed uh, uh, transfer of resources from, from the, the socialist sector to the private sector. I mean, people uh, take some f uh, feed, feed for the ca cattle from the socialist sector, and, and, this, and also perhaps fertilizers and this kind of, 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 of concealed uh, transfer.
transformation. Uh, then, uh, but the, I, I see this as an uh, as an indication of that uh, uh, people uh, still still have an interest to to be more or less uh, independent entrepreneurs also in, in a very limited scale. Yeah. Uh, although you said you didn't want to put your finger in the current production problems for the Soviet Union, I wonder if I might lead you that way a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we know that in the last couple of years, uh, the Soviet Union has been buying grain abroad, mm -hmm. including in this country quite extensively. If one reads the current magazines in this country, the explanation they give for Soviet agricultural production problems is lack of incentives. Yeah. Workers working on either mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Yeah. Never or very seldom does one ever see any mention made of weather factors or climate factors mm -hmm. uh, affecting Soviet production, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. seems to me may be considerably overlooked. I wonder if you would give just, just a, a great overview of how you feel about this. Will the Soviet Union in the long run always have an agricultural production problem? Yeah. Will, it, uh, will weather factors continually be a problem? I think that every country will still have <laughs> agriculture problem, and I think that the problems they are shifting. And and uh, if I am uh, replying to the question in a more indirect way, then the policy here in this country is, for the time being, uh, 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 quite an. an and other than it was two or three years ago, and uh, because I have I have read some papers uh, or, or speeches by the by your minister of, of the secretary of agriculture, and now now you are you are putting more more emphasis here in this country on on, on the on the export, and that cannot mean anything else that that the uh, government in this country. Is, is calculating with that the, the, there will be a, a deficit in some other countries and, for instance, in the Soviet Union. I, I cannot uh, interpret the, the policy now just uh, on the threshold, so to say, in this country, in, in other words. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, of course uh, we can say that the agriculture in Soviet is, is more sensitive for weather, I think, than, than in, in the States, uh, particularly in the, in the new regions and, uh, and uh, uh, during Khrushchev's era, uh, perhaps too much of the new land was taken into cultivation, new land which not in the long run can, uh, can uh, serve as, as agricultural land. Uh, well, yeah. I am not sure that I could answer your question. Well, yeah. Chemical fertilizer, is that uh, going up? Is it, is it need more? Yeah, yeah. The use of fertilizer is, is, is going up. That, that, that's, a, that's a matter of fact. Yeah. Apparently, Russia is uh, emphasizing the current five-year plan uh, the pursuit of the increase of animal proteins uh, as a very uh, high priority part of their agricultural mm -hmm. uh, uh, budget. Uh, you mentioned heat grains. Um, what do you What do you feel are the possibilities uh, that Russia might have, say, between these alternatives, between producing their heat grains uh, in order to get their animal protein? Mm -hmm. or in terms of importing their heat grains to get their animal proteins, or in terms of importing their animal proteins. Uh, in other words, as I understand it, there has been considerable discussion that's gone on in the Soviet uh, agricultural uh, sector with respect to those particular options. And uh, actually, I haven't seen any uh, uh, in indications of what are the probabilities attached to each one of those 
alternatives mm. in terms of realizing their increase in proteins in their diets. You mean in the in the you mean as as uh, human beings for, uh, no, for for human beings yeah. for human beings. Yeah, yeah, that's a worldwide, but, but you see, Bob. Right now, but, 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 but I understand that the Russians are really trying to press forward on this particular objective in the current five year plan. Yeah. Uh, but that's, anyway, interesting to note that both, both Brezhnev and Kasigin, in their speeches, they first and foremost stress the importance of uh, produce more grain. And uh, I have interpreted this in such a way that in the short run, they will put m most emphasis on the grain production. And uh, I don't know if anybody has been in Moscow or in some other, other cities in Soviet Union uh, recently, but there have been a shortage of bread in, in some, in some in, uh, instances. We cannot deny it. But then we come to the long run, long run uh, uh, aspects, and uh, I th should think that uh, for political reasons, Soviet, uh, the aim or the intention of Soviet government is to become as soon as possible self-sufficient also in uh, the protein. And there are, of course, technical possibilities. Uh, I should say there are very good technical possibilities to grow, uh, to grow um, uh, protein for I think that the, the political reasons are, are the dominant. Well, yeah. Would you have a comment regarding a general question about these five-year plans? Uh, we have heard for many years of a series of five-year plans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. It, it has that been uh, a method by which to what extent has that been For the sure. method by which goals have been achieved and mm -hmm. progress has been made? Uh, <laughs> you mean in the long run? Or, uh, I think... Well, uh, here's a country that has had uh, the emphasis upon the five-year plan. Yeah. Uh, I have no figures about that, but... Uh, I have only a feeling that that uh, the, f uh, the uh, targets have not been fulfilled, in, at least not in, in all respects. Uh, and uh, if we if we go back to the Khrushchev's era, during then my feeling is that the, the plans at that time. They were uh, too optimistic, and uh, now, uh, now uh, they have a more realistic grasp on the problem. But to what extent this current five years plan will, will be fulfilled or not, uh, it's uh, I am not capable to give any answer. It doesn't seem to be, but nobody knows. Well, yeah. Do you have any uh, feel for the difference between the uh, yield that the agricultural scientists are obtaining and the yield that, the, uh, that are being obtained on the farms there? Um, what the, well, how well, percentage of the potential uh, are they now getting? Do you, do you know at all? See, uh, uh, I, 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 you know I'm sorry. How much of the potential are they now getting? How much do the agricultural science put up 
say, well, they can get about so much, well, how much are they, of that are they now? Is it, is it traumatic or is it technical? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I have no other indi indication as what I already mentioned that in, in the, in the uh, speech uh, of, of Mr. Kasigin, he, he said that four centner pro hectares should be a, a realistic to, to increase the uh, the um, uh, grain yield. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.